everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your girl, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, person who loves talking about money and person who has a little bit of hay fever going, so you're going to have to excuse the congestion. It, it doesn't sound good, but listen, sometimes this is what we have to work with. It's early spring. My fellow allergy ha- havers, you guys know how it is. Um, And today we have a very, very exciting guest, someone that I have been trying to get on the podcast for quite some time. In fact, uh, she is one of the last people I hung out with pre-pandemic, like how little we knew, right? Like we were running through Times Square, just having a little fun night, everything seemed normal, and then... And then we all know what happened after that. Um, But pretty much since that time, I've been trying to get her on TFD in some capacity. Um, And obviously, again, global pandemic that just wasn't in the cards. Um, But we were able to finally sync up to do this podcast. And it's one that I've been particularly excited about. As you guys know, I don't often interview other YouTubers because, quite frankly, a lot of YouTubers don't have a ton of interesting things to say about money slash are completely sort of disconnected from the realities of money. A lot of famous YouTubers are just like multimillionaire 23-year-olds. The river doesn't run too deep when it comes to talking about money. Or in many cases, when it comes to talking about things like capitalism, economics, the sort of context and framework through which we're all navigating our personal finances. Um, But much like YouTuber Big Joel, uh, aka medium-sized Henry, that you guys may have seen my interview with last year, there are some YouTubers that do really cover all of those subjects um, and lots of other stuff with a ton of, you know, nuance and thoughtfulness. And my guest today is one of those people, one of my personal favorite YouTubers and hopefully someone that you guys love as much as I do. It's Abigail Thorne, actress and YouTuber, creator of the Philosophy Tube podcast. Hi. Hello. Hello. It's lovely to be here. Finally. <laughs> I know. It's finally, finally worked out. Where are you calling in from? Uh, from London, from, from old, old London town. And before we get started, I want to thank Avast for supporting today's episode of the Financial Confessions. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. For those who may not be as familiar, can you explain a little bit what Philosophy Tube is? Oh, wow. (laughs) Uh, I guess so. Nine years ago, almost, um, I was about to start studying for a degree in philosophy at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And the government decided to triple university tuition fees. Um, I was in the last year to pay the old fees before they got tripled. And I had a lot of friends who couldn't go to, to, go, go to, couldn't go to university anymore. And philosophy was already kind of a difficult subject to access. Um, and so I, I thought that was quite unfair. And in my second year of university, a friend suggested I start a YouTube channel for stand-up comedy. And I was like, I don't think I'm good enough to do that. Um, But I liked the idea of a YouTube channel and I had this idea of, um, you know, giving away my, of giving away a philosophy degree for free, for making it more accessible. And I just kind of like smashed these two ideas together in my brain and thought, what if I did a philosophy YouTube channel, which at the time did not exist. Um, You know, now you can throw a stone in the woods and you'll hit 10 people summarizing Plato. Um, But back then there was like nothing. It was like PBS idea channel and that was it. Um, And so my original plan was just to film all of my lectures and upload them onto YouTube, but the university said, you can't do that. So I started out in my parents' bedroom, just summarizing what I'd learned in lessons and just saying, this is what I learned today. And um, Uh nine years on, it's it's become a lot bigger than that. Um, Now the videos aren't like five minutes long. They're usually like 45 minutes or thereabouts. And I use costumes and characters and theater and everything I've learned from the acting world to try and explain and bring home philosophical concepts in a way that makes them engaging, that relates them to people's everyday experience, um, and that just kind of enables people to to do philosophy and to think for themselves, rather than just kind of like, listen to somebody reading out a Wikipedia article about Nietzsche, you know? Um, So that's that's kind of the mission is, uh, is is teaching philosophy in a fun way. That's that's what I say to people who've like never even heard of YouTube and don't have a concept of that. I would love to meet a person who's never heard of YouTube. That person probably. Well, there are people who like who like aren't really sure like what are you, they have heard of YouTube, but that have never like don't really sit down and watch a YouTube video. That's just not part of their not part of their life. Um, so the way I the way I explain it to people is I say I teach philosophy in a fun way. I would agree with that. Do you have any one particular video that you feel like I really I really went off here? Ooh. 
I mean, food, body, mind was one that I did last year. And I am, I am quite proud of that because I thought it, I thought it balanced the intellectual with the artistic, with the personal quite nicely. Those are kind of the three dimensions that I come at it from. And I thought that blended them quite nicely. And also I've, a lot of people wrote to me and said that meant something to them. Uh, my coming out video, Identity, uh, which is now over a year old, was also, I think, you know, artistically one of my best. Um, but I've, I've got more stuff in the works. Like I'm excited about my next one, which is going to be about technology. Um, I've got some kind of fun, fun ideas for how to stage that and like an old character that's going to be coming back. And um, yeah, so that's uh, that's going to be fun. So but the answer to what's your favorite video is always the next one. <laughs> Now, when it comes to the kinds of videos that you, the topics that you choose and the things that you talk about, sometimes they do seem very kind of relevant to what's happening. You recently did one on vaccinations and kind of, you know, the the sort of overall zeitgeist that's happening there. But then oftentimes you do one that seem kind of very removed from whatever happens to be in the news. Is there sort of a method for choosing the topics and Beyond that, is there a way that, is there sort of like a, do you have sort of a house line or like something that you want people to take away from your videos, an overarching message, a way that you approach these topics? Uh, well, I would say, is there a method for choosing videos? Method is a strong word. Um, I uh, I follow the curiosity. I mean, I've, I've, I've said this before sometimes that for Philosophy Tube, it seems like there's like a little, little spirit that, that tells me what it has to be and I just have to listen to that. Um, so I'll usually at the end of the year in like December time, I'll sit down and I'll make a list of a bunch of things that I'm interested in. And I'll just have a list of like potential future episodes in my phone. I have like a whole document. And when I, when I finish a video and it's time to choose the next one, I'll scroll down that list. And usually one of them will like grab me and I'll go, Oh, Oh, I want to do a video about this. And this is what I'm feeling right now. So, um, it's, it's a very kind of like, like a very sort of drama school. You just kind of have to listen to the creativity uh, exercise. So I wouldn't say there was like a method. Um, it's, it's not like a hard and fast process. Sometimes it, it is like something that's very relevant to the news, but even then it's often on a delay. So I knew I wanted to do one on vaccinations and, and COVID even when the pandemic started, but it's taken me like two years for the voice to actually say, and this is what it needs to be. Right. Um, so I, not not really a method, no. In terms of a house line, um, I I do have some rules about the kinds of things that I make on the show. So I don't want people to see knowledge and learning as competitive. Um, I I don't like people. To, I don't want people to watch my show and feel like, oh yeah, that's been like debunked or like she really went in on that guy and like demolished his point of view. I don't like to do that. I like it to be something where people feel like they can sit and listen and and be constructive and bring their own thoughts to it um I, I don't like personally just for me I don't like this kind of quite aggressive like debate style I, I try to I try to do something non-competitive um in that way um mainly just because like at university I did the whole debating society thing and it didn't thrill me um it didn't seem to be a good way of learning so I guess that's the kind of I try to be like non-aggressive and non-competitive in the way that I teach. And I also have like rules about the the presenter persona that I adopt on the show um in that I I try to never get angry and I try to never get mean on the show and I try to never single anyone out and, and like make them feel bad. So I would never say on Philosophy Tube, "Hey John Smith, you suck." Like because when I started I made a promise to myself that I would never use the platform to single anyone out and like make them feel bad. Because when I started, it was very much the height of the kind of new atheism, skepticism movement on YouTube that did a lot of that. And, and I saw how that could really make people feel bad. So now, even if there's someone I very much disagree with, I try not to single them out and make them feel bad. Even if I do a video, like I've done a couple of videos on Jordan Peterson, I try to avoid any kind of like, even though I disagree with him, personal dunks or like making fun of his personal life and stuff. Because I, it's just not despite the kind of thing how I'm easy, doing. sorry, despite how easy that would be to do. <laughs> yeah, well, people, yeah, people, people sometimes do say that, and and I and arguably sometimes there are some people who who maybe should kind of be called out personally. Um, I I'm not saying there's never any place for that on YouTube at all, but it's not it's not the philosophy tube way. 
Um, and and this extends like right across all of my sort of personal branding. Like if if you go on like my Twitter or my Facebook, for instance, all the kind of official philosophy tube outlets, I I very rarely and I hope never say anything negative about anyone. I never like single anyone out and go at John Smith, you you fool. Um, I I just really try not to do that because I don't want to cultivate the kind of audience that expects that. Um, and I, I don't I don't want to cultivate the kind of personality in me that does that either um i was having a i was having a discussion with a friend of mine a journalist recently about the personas that we adopt online and uh there are some youtubers who are very much the same in person as they are online and there are some who are very different um and there are some who who have um adopt this persona online that is like quite mean and cynical and edgy and in real life, they're just the biggest sweethearts. Like they're just so lovely, and they're just like pushovers. And I, I was having this discussion with my friend about the personas we adopt, and uh, about kind of authenticity online. And um, I said, if you are going to adopt a persona online as a presenter, um, then surely it's better to adopt a persona that is like nicer and kinder than you are in real life. Like um, in real life, I do get angry and I do get kind of jealous and I do have these negative feelings, of course, like everyone does, but I try to keep that off the show um, out of a desire to kind of cultivate similarly positive vibes in, in the audience. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the closest thing I would say to like a house style. Yeah, you're a better woman than I am because I <laughs> definitely, when it comes to certain figures, I actually love your Jordan Peterson video. It's one of my favorites. Um, and I oh, guess looking you. back, oh, <laughs> I guess looking back, it's not, um, I guess it's not mean. I think the thing with figures like that, that are so kind of pernicious in the culture, you don't really have to say all that much that is sort of directly antagonistic in order to paint a pretty damning picture. And I think that your video does that quite well. You know, I think a person walks away, even if they don't feel that you sort of have a personal axe to grind with uh, him as a person that, you know, the ideas themselves are pretty easy to kind of knock down. But I also think in some ways what can be tough about it, especially so to kind of move it to the sociopolitical space, I feel like one of the things that is often difficult for people who have progressive ideals who are on the left is that we do often, I think, care a little bit more about being kind and about not, you know, um, directly attacking. And meanwhile, I mean, I don't know exactly how it is in Britain, but I can say that in the U.S., like, there are huge, huge swaths of sort of the political and cultural zeitgeist on the right. And especially when it comes to things like personal finance, when you look at like a lot of the narratives, they're so directly antagonistic. They're so directly, you know, shaming, you know, ostracizing when it comes to people in poverty, when it comes to, you know, especially women who might be taking social services, all of that kind of stuff. And it can be really effective, right? People like to hear it. They like to see it. You know, there are millions and millions of views on these videos of, you know, um, the kind of thought leaders where they're just tearing into someone for bad decisions they've made or they're tearing into mm -hmm. a politician for, you know, not having kind of the right policies. And I wonder, do you feel like in kind of holding back in that way that either you're sort of ceding ground in some way or that you make it almost, you make it almost easier for the opposition to to sort of own that territory of, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To own the territory of that satisfying sort of cathartic debate. Yes, this is something that I've certainly become very aware of, in particular in the last few years. One of the big questions I think hanging over Philosophy Tube as a, as a project um, is that if it's aimed at uh, alleviating ignorance and educating people, what do we do about people who want to remain ignorant um who, or even people whose their job depends on them remaining ignorant that i think is one of the big questions that kind of hangs over the project and and i think a fair criticism that someone could give me is is that the channel does not equip people to deal with um those who who want to remain in ignorance um or those whose, whose power and influence depends on maintaining deliberate ignorance. And um, I think certainly, uh, in particular, a lot of the transphobia in the media in the UK is uh, based in deliberate ignorance and, and 
people have a financial incentive to maintain that ignorance. So yes, I think somebody could very fairly criticize the channel uh, on, on those grounds. Um, all I can say is that uh, the, the philosophy tube, the philosophy tube jutsu is a, is a strong one. It's one that served me well. Um, in particular, this policy of um, of never saying anything negative about anyone kind of personally is is part of what has allowed the channel to go on as long as it has. Right. Um, because I have seen other creators who, I wouldn't say pick fights, but who do get into one-on-ones with other creators. And it takes a lot out of you. And you know, I me, me and, and some close friends, we talk about the, the philosophy tube jutsu, which is never say anything negative about anyone. And on a long enough timeline, your enemies will cancel themselves. <laughs> um, and, and that has proven to be overwhelmingly true in my case. Um, there have been uh, people over the years who've, who've like tried to come for me and even in some cases who've directly libeled me. And I just kind of, I, sometimes I really want to hit back. There are a lot of people that I would love to just take out my phone and, and tweet to 300,000 people. Hey, you like, screw you. Um, that would be lovely, but I don't, I don't do that because it's, it, it feels like philosophy tube is bigger than me. It, it's, it's not the Abigail Thorne show. Um, it is in a sense about taking a certain attitude towards education and learning. Um, and perhaps some people might say that's quite a pretentious stance um, and, and perhaps there'd be, <laughs> be kind of a grain of truth in that. Um, but it, it's something that I that I picked up from my own philosophy teacher way back in the day when I was at school um, and something that's that served me well. Um, but in answer to your question, yeah, I think that's that would be a very fair criticism, actually. And to be clear, I'm not trying to say that like, hey, you need to be yelling about other YouTubers more. But I do also think that you know, it it can be very disheartening from, again, from the perspective that I'm in when it comes to economics and finance to Mm -hmm. see how far you can go in trying to, you know, for example, you know, you can make a hundred videos that very clearly and very sort of in a data-driven way will break down the welfare queen myth and will explain why this is not true on aggregate and why all of our notions about people who receive social services are actually quite the opposite. And then you have one, like, you know, someone who works for, like, the Daily Wire getting off a tweet about how, you know, these lazy bitches won't stop, you know, using food stamps to buy cigarettes or whatever they say. And that wins, you know? And I yeah. do feel yeah. that it can it can feel somewhat not hopeless, but it can you it does feel like you're up against at least for me uh, a very very powerful you know emotionally driven uh, rhetorical machine. Yes, yes, um, I definitely yeah I do understand <laughs> I do understand that position, um, especially you know uh, somebody uh, a, a trans woman living in in Britain and uh, seeing the way that our media goes, uh, I definitely understand that position. Um, but yeah, as as I say, like the the philosophy tube jutsu is is what has enabled the channel to live as long as it has, and and for me to kind of remain sane and healthy, um, and to keep making it. So uh, it's a kind of inevitable compromise. I think if philosophy tube ever does kind of like end definitively, I think I would want to end it by writing philosophy tube the book and kind of like stepping out of the channel and critiquing what I've done in a different medium. Um, and and that's definitely is like I've got a list of chapters that that book will eventually contain, um, and uh, one of them is you know how do we deal with with people who want to remain ignorant because that because you know spreading that narrative on social media is is how they put food on the table. Um, yeah, I definitely see where you're coming from. <laughs> I think these are good points. <laughs> I want to take a quick pause here and once again thank today's episode sponsor Avast. As a digital first media company, and as you can tell from today's episode, digital safety is incredibly necessary in all forms, and it is something that is very important to us here at TFD. Today's sponsor, Avast, has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy, no matter who you are, where you are, how you connect, or your budget. Avast One offers both free and premium options. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And just a few of their important features that you need to be integrating into your digital routine are things like their antivirus coverage, which is award-winning and stops viruses and malware from harming your devices, as well as data breach monitoring, which allows you to find out if your online accounts have been compromised and whether your passwords need to be changed. This is something we need to do all the time at TFD because it is very stressful running so many online accounts that we need to be protective of and could be theoretically 
theoretically hacked into and someone could say something crazy from one of our accounts. Suffice to say, data breach monitoring is super important to us here at TFD, and it's something you should have too. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month, and with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your digital presence without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And now let's get back to our chat with Abby of Philosophy Two. As you mentioned, so you, when did you do your coming out video? That was, I want to say January, 2021. Yeah. Okay. So like a a little over a year ago where for context, Mm -hmm. um, you came out as a very elegant and aspirational woman that we see before us. Um, Oh, thank you. That's kind. (laughs) I'm all about the, uh, the, the cheekbones. We got it all. We got it all happening. Um, (laughs) Do you feel that your content has changed quite a bit? Do you feel like either the subjects that you cover or the way that you cover them have changed since you've come out? Uh, well, the core of it, I think, remains the same. That kind of attitude we talked about, uh, the attitude towards learning, the non-competitiveness, that was always there. Um, I think certainly the, the way the show looks has changed. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, I, I do think more now about the style of it. Like one thing that's changed is all of my videos post coming out. I've been working with a stylist and a makeup artist, and that gives me a little bit more, a little bit more room aesthetically to play than I did before. Um, and I think, I don't think the topics necessarily have changed because I'm still following that little spirit and still following the curiosity. I very deliberately don't make videos about like trans content. I right. I very deliberately don't don't do that. I think it's kind of it's been done better by other YouTubers. <laughs> um and uh it's I don't I don't want my channel to become like just about LGBT content. It is supposed to be for a much more general audience. Um it does come up occasionally because being trans is kind of philosophically quite fascinating often. Um, and also it, it's, uh, there's like a lot of fun, a lot of fun jokes you can make with it. Um, in particular, it's uh, it's very funny when I get commenters who, the nature of philosophy tube is that you don't have to watch every single one, right? You can like jump in and out right. for a few months and I don't I don't mind that. Um, but it's, it's always very funny when somebody uh, leaves a comment saying, hey, I haven't watched this show in a while. What happened to the other presenter? And I'm like, <laughs> Welcome, welcome back. Um, and most, like all, all the time, people are like very, very complimentary about them. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. Um, if I couldn't see it on the screen, I wouldn't believe it, you know. Um, which also is like kind of how it how it feels to me. Um, but uh, no, I don't think it's changed all that much. Perhaps I wouldn't be the person to ask about that though. Perhaps the audience would be the best person to ask. I think there are there are certainly audience reactions that I get now that I didn't before. So I did always get a lot of people talking about my looks, but that it's, it's a lot more now. There's a lot more of that now. Welcome um, to the club. Being a woman on YouTube yes, it's awesome. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I was kind of prepared for that. Um, and also I think I, I there, there was always been people who didn't like the show and there's always been people who've uh, been mean about the show. But I would say that the level of venom has definitely increased after terrible. coming out i would say that the the nasty and the hateful comments that i get are now a lot more potent um that whereas before people might have said oh like this like ah, this show like really sucks i don't like the host now people will really really go in and kind of criticize me as a person so part of what i wanted to talk about from a financial aspect is so obviously over the past two years you have completely like i would I don't know if you have a lot of your old clothes, but you certainly have a lot of new ones. A beauty routine, hair, grooming. Uh, We got the nails going. We got, I'm sure we're getting like spa treatments. We got facials. We got all kinds of stuff. Plus, I would love to go to the spa. Oh my gosh. Don't tell me they're still closed in in England. I mean, no, no. I mean, a trans woman going to a spa in London is just, it's it's asking. In in my opinion, perhaps this isn't the case, but I, I, I would not feel safe doing that like um i was in the us recently visiting a friend and she did arrange to like go to a massage and i was uh, i was amazed um that uh, the the uh massage therapist um was another trans person and that like trans people were just kind of openly welcomed in this spa but i, I think me as a trans woman going to a spa in london i would feel like this is a headline waiting to happen i i just would not feel 
safe doing yeah. that right now in the current political climate. Um, but yes, you're right. Um, in other dimensions, certainly like there's a whole new wardrobe. Um, I kept one suit from the old days, a purple suit that I used to present philosophy tube in. Um, it's in a couple of my old videos. Um, and I'm actually thinking about having that like converted and retailored um, into like into like a woman's cut suit with like the buttons on the other side and like different lapels and stuff. I'm thinking about getting that done, but that was the only thing I kept. Other than that, uh, yes, suddenly I needed an entirely new wardrobe so and suddenly needed to spend a lot more money on skincare. <laughs> can you talk about the finances of doing that as an adult and sort of specifically um, for context for people at home, when we were initially talking just pre-pandemic, I was speaking uh, to her and another YouTuber possibly about doing a series of videos on the finances of performing gender, both masculine and feminine. This was actually prior yeah. to, to you coming out and whatnot. Yeah, that was so, that was so wild. Because I mean, I did, I did do that thing. I did do the kind of like James Bond thing for a while. Like I tried, as, as a lot of trans people do, we sense that something is wrong with the gender that we were assigned at birth and like your first instinct is to double down. So I did do that kind of like, you know, custom suits and, you know, like dating models and like being in the gym all the time. I did do all of that. So yes, I can understand why you initially approached me to do a video about the finances of masculinity. Well, listen, a I subject mean about which it is apparent that I know very little. No, but it's also for what it's worth. I mean, again, like it's, it's fairly rare especially in America where men are just like, they got get it together guys. Like we got to get a little, like a little personal style and grooming going. I feel like you can walk <laughs> into like a nice restaurant in the U S and men will be wearing literally t-shirts and flat brim baseball caps, like, or basketball hats. Like what is going on? But so yeah, obviously you, uh, you know, then and now had quite a, uh, a refined and, and considered level of personal style, let's say. Um, well, that's kind of you. Well, you know, listen, again, not that you weren't standing out regardless in a good way, but in America, not hard to like really look like you're putting in the effort. But I'm curious about what the finances were of sort of completely overhauling your presentation as an adult. And more importantly, if you've noticed a really sort of direct correlation between, you know, you mentioned the stylist, makeup artist, things like that, a correlation between spending more money and sort of not just beyond obviously being a woman, being the sort of woman that you aspire to, because that's something that as women, I think we struggle with enormously is like the idea of women we have in our heads that we want to to be and appear, appear as in the world is almost a one-to-one -one correlation with money. Yes. Um, yes, that's very true. And even more so in, in, in Britain, really. I mean, I knew... <laughs> I, as I was, again, I had this long period of planning what the coming out would be um, and being able to sort of sit and plan what the sort of public persona would be. Um, and in Britain, I, I, I knew that I was not only going to be like one of the most high profile trans women in the country, but also just like a woman in Britain in the public eye. And I felt um, that there was an expectation to be kind of the closer you are to Kate Middleton, the easier time you're going to have. And that there is this kind of quite prim, stylish, quite proper um, way that women in the public eye are expected to be if we are to be taken seriously. Um, and uh, I remember when I did my coming out photo shoot, the photographer asked me, what's the vibe we're going for? And I said, well, Emma Watson, if she was the captain of a woman's rowing team, <laughs> it's like kind of, it's like kind of what we need because that's, that's sort of what British women I feel, or I, I felt at the time, are expected to be if, if we're going to be taken seriously. Um, so in terms of the finances of, of the transformation, um, actually the first thing was that I had a lot to get rid of. I had a whole, you know, a whole 20 something years worth of clothes to get rid of. Um, I had to take them down to the charity shop. It's uh, it's kind of almost slightly haunting, you know, it's because like, you get rid of somebody's old clothes when they die and like, you have put the clothes in bin bags and take them down. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and I sort of gave some things away and, and sold some other things. I had a, I had a male flatmate um, at the time and uh, I said to him, you know, do you, do you want any of these? And he was like, yeah, actually, <laughs> please, I'll have these. Um, so that was good. And the process of like building up the new wardrobe has been slow and steady. Um, I, I, have, I have a large pile of shoes over there that I try to kind of 
cut down every few months. I go in with a machete and then I go and give some of them away, but then I kind of acquire them again. Um, because uh, I work with a stylist, Brian, on Philosophy Tube. Um, Brian is um, Brian's actually the highest paid person on the Philosophy Tube set. <laughs> Hell yeah, Brian. <laughs> he, uh, he, he really, really works hard. And, and we sit down uh, before every video and we design the looks together. And um, usually there'll be one or two items where at the end of the show, he'll say, well, I can't return these. I can't like, give them away. Do you want to keep them? Um, so sometimes I get like little presents from, from Brian the stylist. So I have like a nice pair of trainers um, that he got for the show that I just kind of acquired and some sweatpants and stuff. Um, in terms of like my own clothes, so and, and the clothes that I wear every day, I mostly find those um, myself. And, and there are... <laughs> I don't want to like give the specific brands that I'm going for, um, but like this this um, this dress I chose uh, myself. Um, I don't I don't tend to go for like big, big end luxury stuff. I don't really like that all that much. Um, I mean, I try and bear in mind like a pound of wear, right? Um, is that if you're gonna if you spend like eighty pounds or something, you should try and wear it like eighty times um, at least. Um, I, I don't always succeed in managing that. Sometimes if it's for a special occasion, I might spring for something fancier. Um, but yeah, like it. it it has been, um, I do spend a lot more money now on clothes and uh, in particular, like my, my skincare, products. like spend a lot more on skincare products now. Um, and also there, like being being transgender in the UK is extremely expensive um, because the NHS kind of de facto does, I mean, we have free healthcare in this country. Um, if you're cisgender, um, de jure transition is provided by the NHS de facto, that is not the case. Um, so you, you you need to find kind of other ways of uh, of doing that. Um, so yeah, uh, it it has been uh, it has been an interesting uh, an interesting financial journey. <laughs> um, but it all starts with like putting putting everything in bin bags and taking it down to the charity shop. Did you have a budget for totally overhauling your wardrobe when you started, or was it just like we're just gonna go rogue? <laughs> No, I mean it was it was it was very slow and steady. Um, I wonder, can I tell this? Yeah, go on. I can tell this story. Um, so when I when I started out, um, I deliberately tried to buy. I I bought a dress because you know as I was beginning to realize what I needed to do, and I was still very much in denial. Um, I uh, I said, well, you know, I tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a dress. I'm gonna buy the ugliest nastiest dress cheapest dress i possibly can i'm gonna put it on i'm gonna turn around and when i see myself in the mirror i'm gonna think how foolish oh how could i ever think this and then i'll put the dress away and i'll be able to move on with my life and i'll never need to do this i'll be able to put all these thoughts away um and of course i bought this kind of incredibly horrible gray sack and put it on and turned around and was like ah oh, my life has changed forever now because i love it <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't i didn't have a budget really um and uh, I kind of still don't. Um, the way the way that Philosophy Tube works is financially is that all of the money um, that kind of comes in through Patreon and the kind of small peanuts that comes in through advertising and sponsorships and so on goes into like a separate account that is for making the show. And that's the account from which all the kind of crew and the stylist and the makeup artist, everyone is paid. And I get like a small salary from that account. Um, and then at the end of every tax year, I sit down and I say, okay, how much is in this? How much is going to roll over to the next year? And like, how much am I going to be able to like live on? Um, so I don't really have like a set budget per se. Um, I just try very hard to be kind of frugal and also to kind of take care of the crew and the stylist and the venue and everyone. That all happens first. And then I, then I, then I get my kind of cut out of it. And the rest all just kind of rolls over into the show because the, the money that, um, the money that kind of goes into the show, I don't really see that as mine. So when it comes to the money that you make on the channel, so when you do acting jobs, that's your money, that's you. And then you have yes. the channel. And what are the streams of money that you have going into the channel? You have Patreon and what else do you do? Patreon there's, is, is, is the main one. That's the biggest slice. There's a, there's a tiny little bit through advertising, um, like pre-roll ads on YouTube. Um, Typically, that's that's not really much because, especially for an educational channel, um, the amount of money you get in advertising is 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 very small. Um, sometimes I'll do a sponsored video, uh, like through Nebula um, or Curiosity Stream. So I have uh, and my my agent uh, Dave at Standard who handles that sort of thing. Um, 
So those, there's those three. Oh, and sometimes people make, um, or they used to be able to make one-time donations through PayPal. That's because PayPal screwed up. You can't do that anymore. Um, so I don't have that, but I did used to. Um, I would say those are those are the three. Oh, also sometimes there is like Philosophy Tube merch. I'm not really big on the kind of the merch scene because again, that kind of attitude of um, I don't want it to be competitive. I don't want it to be kind of a consumer. I don't want knowledge to be a kind of a consumer artifact. So I don't, I don't really tend to like push the merch all that much, but there is some Philosophy Tube merch out there. Um, and so that's kind of another like, even even tinier bit of it. But I would say that's, uh, those are all the ones I can think of. If I've forgotten any, uh, then, then I apologize. But yeah, those are the, those are the, Patreon is, is, is the biggest slice. One of the people that a lot of our listeners are familiar with because she's been on the channel many times, she's done a mini series with us that you and I both know is Lindsay Ellis, who recently sort of quit the internet because, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into this. You can watch the video. She talked all about the finances of getting canceled in what I feel was an extremely spurious and unfair way. But suffice to say, she went through quite a lot and left YouTube. And I know, and she did, I think, allude to this in her leaving letter, but I even knew back before that how much it, the only thing that was keeping her on YouTube, getting ad revenue, you know, making content was the fact that she had a lot of people to support who worked for her. Um, that she, you know, paid probably, frankly, looking back better than she could really even afford to, especially when it came to like all the healthcare and stuff. Um, and you mentioned that you have a team that you pay and that sort of sees the money before you see it. A, do you feel a pressure to, you know, you mentioned you do some sponsorships, but not a ton. Do you feel a pressure to monetize the channel beyond what you would personally want because of them? And then also you had mentioned, you know, if acting does get bigger, you know, YouTube will kind of take that back seat or might just, you know, go to a book and then kind of go away. Do you feel that what is keeping you sort of in the current flow of things is more still your own desire to do it or the fact that you now have a team that, you know, wants philosophy tube to keep going and, and paying them? Uh, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely my own uh, desire that's keeping the show going. Um, from what I know of, of Lindsay's kind of situation with regards to her retirement, um, she obviously had to provide health insurance for her, uh, I guess, team team members, employees, um, which in the in the UK, because we have like a national health service, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, I don't have to, you know, if there's somebody I don't work with anymore, it's not, you know, they're not uh, not getting health care. Um, but um no, I, I would say it is definitely my own desire doing that. Um, sometimes, sometimes it lines up, and there's kind of additional opportunities. So, uh, at some point last year, um, a couple of the guys uh, in in the crew who I've who are friends who I've worked with for years, um, they said, "Oh, we'd quite like to do a behind the scenes documentary about Philosophy Tube. We think that people would like that. It's something we're interested in shooting. What do you think?" And I said, "Oh, you know who would really like that is my agent in the U.S. who does all the stuff with Nebula." because we could do it as a Nebula exclusive. Um, I don't like the idea of putting educational content behind a paywall. I do want that to be free. Right. But if it's like an extra behind the scenes thing about how the show is made, maybe we could do that as a Nebula exclusive. Um, and so we did. Um, and there was a, a, a paycheck that came, or that, that uh, I think at time of recording will be coming soon, I hope, um, for that Nebula exclusive. And I said to the crew, I said, okay, this is gonna be like your, your bonus. This is, this is for you. Um, because normally the way we do things is that like it, it's kind of my show and I call the shots and I do the directing and the editing and stuff. Um, but I said this time, if you guys are handling this, is if this is something that you're going to handle the production and the editing of, I see no reason why you guys shouldn't like get the lion's share of of, of the income from this. Um, so that is that's what we're going to do with that with that money. Um, but that wasn't so much a kind of monetizing it in addition, uh, so much as this was like an opportunity that came along that would kind of get them like a nice bonus um, and also kind of keep my agent happy and that I certainly didn't mind doing because I just kind of like being on set and working with the guys um and uh my uh so the so this I mean I say we have a team there's like three it's like me and then like three or four others there's um I, I won't mention their names because they like to kind of stay behind the scenes but Mr. X and Mr. Y do the kind of camera work um and uh Brian is a stylist and then I have um depending on who's available, there's like a few makeup artists that I like to work with. 
um and the, you know they all have other jobs um there, there's nobody who's like just dependent on philosophy tube apart from me um i don't have a there's no like behind the scenes staff sometimes i get emails that address like a dear abigail or admin staff and I'm like, I don't have, it's just me um i handle all the social media all the admin all the production all the editing all of that kind of thing um, so there's nobody, there's nobody who's in an analogous situation to um, what some of Lindsay's employees were in, which is they're kind of wholly dependent on this as their full time job. Well, I'm going to start putting a, a glam squad for me in our budget because I'm looking like fried hell on some of these videos. Oh, <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I, I really, truly, one of the things that I have to say I feel very lucky about with our audience is that. For as much as it is so tough to be a woman on YouTube and people are so cruel and so like, you know, unrelenting in their criticisms toward women, we just luckily have an audience that's like 90% plus women, which is like mm -hmm. truly unheard of on YouTube. So like there's almost never really just like nasty appearance based comments that most women on YouTube suffer through. And when there are occasionally like they get swarmed by our commenters who are like, how dare you? <laughs> like. This yes, is so I'm very lucky in that regard too that the, the regular philosophy tube audience are just wonderful. Just saints. They're, <laughs> They're so, so great. So speaking of our audience, we got quite a lot of questions that I want to run through. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, but um, I'm just gonna hit a few of the more upvoted ones. Uh, okay. <clears throat> all right. So have, someone is asking, having gone through some major medical stuff over the past few years, how does Britain's NHS stack up against the image that some Americans have of it? Some people talk about it as if it's the gold standard of nationalized healthcare, but I've also heard some negative stuff. Uh, I think in particular, the NHS's treatment of trans people is is very possibly going to be the subject of a forthcoming video. I think I may have to break my rule of not doing like trans stuff just once. Um, although even then, I, I think it's possibly going to be this uh, within a larger subject. Um, so I'll kind of save my detailed thoughts for then. Um, I think uh, the NHS, the fact that it's free at point of service is kind of wonderful. It has been under political attack for quite some time. Uh, it has been defunded and uh, and cut to the bone really and obviously pushed to breaking point by the pandemic so there are now several million people uh, who are on surgical waiting lists for kind of uh, e even quite important things like you know hip replacements joint replacements that kind of thing um the so the so the nhs in the uk has kind of been pushed to breaking point by successive governments who are trying to privatize it um and uh, to have a more american style system so uh relative to what it could be it's amazing um, I would say that uh, with the little asterisk that if you are trans, things are a lot more difficult. Um, but uh, certainly the NHS has kind of saved, has, uh, when I was when I was younger, kind of saved me. Um, and like I, I was delivered in the NHS, like I was born in the NHS. Um, that didn't kind of cost my parents anything. Um, I had to have uh, some, some kind of quite serious uh, surgery, like 2012, like years and years ago now. Um, and that was completely free. Uh, so certainly relative to what it could be, it's uh, it's incredible. Um, but uh, there's room for improvement, uh, I think. And uh, I, I, yeah, I won't, I won't spoil where I'm gonna go with this uh, future video, but um, yeah, it's uh, the, the horror stories are true, but also the kind of the, uh, the miracle stories are often true as well. Someone is asking, how do we balance not wanting to support the exploitative systems that we live in while still taking care of our personal finances? Yeah, so this is a question that I get a lot. Um, and I'm going to give you a kind of true philosophy answer here and, and critique the terms of the question. Um, because I don't think there is a, a kind of single pithy answer that I can give. But I do get a lot of people asking me about kind of living ethically under capitalism and how to do that. Um, there's a philosopher called Slavoj Žižek who I don't I don't like all of his work, but certainly one thing that I think he does kind of nail is the way in which um, disavowal of capitalism while still engaging in it is actually part of the central mechanism in in certainly imperial countries like Britain and the US by which it is uh, kept functioning, and that people sometimes make a fetish out of trying to do the kind of ethical thing under capitalism, and I absolutely include myself with this. Um, they kind of make a fetish out of disavowing it while still engaging in it. Um, so I, I think 
the question here raises a very, very interesting and difficult point that we probably can't uh, can't get into, um, which is that kind of even if you do do everything as ethically as you possibly can, and, and it is important to try, um, ultimately, like kind of the, the problems are bigger than that. That if everybody did the kind of ethical under capitalism thing, the problem, the central problem, would still remain, um, which is kind of you know the unsustainability of it and the exploitativeness of it. Um, so, yeah, I would have to kind of critique the terms of the question there. Um, I, I think, as the poet Rilke said, you kind of have to live the question on that one. I don't think there is a pithy formula that I can give to answer it, um, except to say that it's kind of important to keep trying. I agree. I also think that it is something that very much scales up or down depending on how much power you have. And in many cases, mm -hmm. money is that power, but it also is like, you know, a systemic position. Like obviously as CEO, like I have a decent amount of employees and that means that I have a huge amount of leverage in terms of the kinds of more or less ethical decisions under capitalism that I can make. Um, and similarly, mm -hmm. you know, if you have enough disposable income to make really discerning choices about where you buy clothes or where you buy food or, you know, where you buy things that can make, you know, that can materially support people who are creating things that are less destructive. I think then it becomes more of an ethical obligation where I think it becomes really tough is, you know, under a certain income level, it's just not possible to make much more ethical decisions. You're not able to buy, yeah. you know, food or clothing or whatever that was sustain sustainably produced. And often those are the people who are sort of most under the microscope for making unethical choices. And I do think that it should definitely be a sliding scale answer based on what you're able to do. Like it very much frustrates me when I'll go to like, you know, a relative's house who lives in, you know, a massive McMansion, you know, on their own like plot of land and their home is like full of just like, you know, bottled water and, you know, all of this stuff that's so unnecessary and so kind of destructive to the environment and sort of they drive these huge SUVs that guzzle gas and this, that and the other. That frustrates me a lot more because those people have the ability to make different choices. They have the ability to mm -hmm. to consume in a different way versus, you know, someone who lives in a food desert and, you know, the South Bronx who can only even get their groceries from like, you know, dollar corner markets. I'm not going to judge them about what choices they're making with, you know, the, the limited options that they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. Um, okay, so... We have someone who's asking, so we have a lot of people who asked about like sort of the pros and cons of making money off of Patreon, what you think of Patreon, what you think of generally relying on your audience to supply most of your money. Yeah, I would, well, I think if you have a wonderful audience, like an incredible audience like I do, um, that's definitely one of the pros. I, I think people do often ask me about Patreon and I definitely got into it at exactly the right time. I got into Patreon when it was starting and when not a lot of people had it. Um, and I have been able to benefit from that kind of like legacy and from being an early adopter of it. Um, so, I mean, partly that was kind of luck um, is that I kind of, I happened to get into it at the, back when Patreon was new and you kind of had to explain to people in the video what it was. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the cons is that you're often reliant on luck and if you're starting now, it's probably harder now that everyone and their mum has a Patreon than it was back in the day. Um, there is a kind of inflexibility, or uh, that's not the right word. There is an unpredictability to it um, that some months are good and some are not so good and sort of have to adjust budgets. Um, but then, you know, the same is true of, of, of a lot of jobs, particularly in the creative sector, particularly acting. Um, so uh, I, I'm kind of used to that. Um, and uh, I also try to, I mentioned before that the money from Philosophy Tube goes into uh, a separate uh, account. And if there's anything left over from the budget of making an episode, it rolls over into the next one. So I, I, I usually manage to maintain like a pretty consistent production quality based on that. So even if I do have some leaner months, there's usually like enough in the Philosophy Tube tank to kind of keep things going until I do until I do a video like the, where we kind of top it up again or I do a sponsorship and we kind of top it up again. Um, so the unpredictability and the fact that it's kind of largely based on luck is, is um, definitely part of it. Um, the pro is that it enables... I mean, one of the, the biggest 
pros for me is that it enables me to not really worry about the algorithm or to not really worry about what's going to be popular and um, i do have some youtuber friends who are very much dependent on like i've got to make this amount of advertising money every month um and so you know I, they they really go into the analytics and they really get in their head about it I, I I don't look at my analytics. Um, I haven't looked at my analytics in years. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to do it. If it makes me feel anxious, I think it's the opposite of making art. Um, it, it kind of really hampers my creativity. And one of the great things about Patreon is that I don't have to do that. Right. I am able to follow the artistic curiosity uh, in a way that I wouldn't be able to do if I was um, dependent on, uh, on advertising money. Um, so yeah, I would say that's the big pro is, uh, is, is the freedom. So we have a lot of people asking about what acting actually pays. And I'm sure it's not like one standard amount across all of the jobs, but I feel like there's yeah. such a mystery about it and such an opaqueness. And obviously like we all know like the actors who make millions of dollars, but then the majority of actors seem like they can't live off of acting. So what does it actually pay? No. Uh, you you are correct, and the and the majority of actors can't live off it, and then and that all actors require two jobs. Even uh, you know, I, I I couldn't live permanently off acting. Um, in particular, the UK there's an added wrinkle because if you're gonna do acting and you like really want to go for it, you kind of have to live in London, which is like one of the most expensive places in the world. Uh, sure is. Even if you live outside of London, you have to pay to get in. Um. And also there's things like if, if you want to be auditioning for TV and film, then you need cameras and lights and like the editing software to do self-tapes because it's all self-tapes now. Well, on a similar note, our last audience question is sort of how do you deal with the mental health gauntlet that is going on auditions slash, you know, having everything about you so open to criticism in the acting process? And how does that stack up against uh, the same thing on YouTube? Well... I, I like auditions. I like it. And um, you kind of have to hang on tightly, let go lightly, as they told me at drama school. Um, I had a had a wonderful audition yesterday for a Netflix show. I obviously I can't say what it was or what it involved, but I just had a, I had a blast. Um, and you kind of have to learn not to take it personally um, in that they might really love you, but if you're too tall compared to the main guy, then then you you're not going to get the role that's not your fault um i had a i had an audition um i had a fantastic audition a couple of weeks ago for uh, an hbo series um for a lovely role in that and uh i submitted my tape um and the casting director was like yeah we really really love you it's fantastic like we, yeah definitely like we can't say firmly yes but you know thumbs up um and then you know a week later my agent called and said hey sorry that role's actually been cut from the script they've they've gone back and done a rewrite and she's not in it anymore and that kind of thing happens and it's it's if you don't get the role, it's not always your fault. Um, in fact, it rarely is. Uh, it's often just, you know, you didn't look right for the part or you did and then and then somebody else came along or, oh, actually the show has been canceled now or it's, it's, it's done a rewrite or there's something else involved here. That kind of thing happens all the time. Um, and like, it, it is especially, there's kind of an added layer of difficulty when, when you're trans because I go up for trans roles and cis roles um, and I'm, I'm quite lucky to be able to do that. Um, but when I go up for a trans role, if the role says trans woman, the casting director is is almost always a cis person, and I don't know what they're thinking or what like or what the producer is expecting, um, and that there's like a handful of trans actresses in the UK and we all know each other, so we text each other like, hey, how was your audition for this? Because they just get all of us in for everything, right? Um, and the, the fun thing, the fun side of that is that you know you end up going out for roles that really you're never gonna get, but the kind of fun practice, um, roles that you're kind of totally unsuited for but you get good practice anyway um, and the downside of that is we never really know like how trans they want us to be like do they i, I had an audition a while ago for um for uh, a trans sex worker in uh in a show and um i i i chose to play it as kind of um like a very glamorous um and kind of very very high status um because that was just what spoke to me about the part um but then i have a i have a friend i was chatting with her and she was like yeah when i did the audition i was like do they want me to not shave? Do they want me to go in there and kind of be like, hello, I'm a trans woman. Like, is this the sort of thing you want? Because you don't know what they, you don't know what they're expecting, right? Um, and uh, in particular, as the industry evolves to now, there's not really an audition. It's just a self tape. So you don't go in the room and say, hi, like I'm Abigail, nice to meet you. There's no opportunity for them to redirect you. You just record a self tape on your own at home. It becomes more and more a game of like, guess what number the casting director is thinking of. 
um, and they, they'll look at you and if they can see the role in the first five seconds, you might get it. Um, so it, it's, it's unusual, but you have to kind of learn not to take things too personally uh, to realize that it's kind of largely just luck. I mean, um, even very, very big shows now will cast on the basis of a, of a 60 second self tape with no follow up audition. Like I got, um, I won't say which, I won't say which, but I, I managed to get, um, quite a large role in, um, in an enormous TV show a while ago. And we're talking like a multi-million pound production. And I got that role based on a 60 second self tape with no round two. I just recorded that like alone at home, like talking to a tape recorder of someone reading the other lines. And they gave me, they, they gave me the role and I was, I was astounded. I was like, you don't want to meet me? You don't want to see me? Like, you don't want to check? You don't want to screen test across another actor? And they're like, no, just do it because that's the way the industry's going. Um, so, yeah, you just you just kind of have to learn not to take any of it uh, not to take any of it personally because a lot of the time you'll get unlucky, but then sometimes you'll get incredibly lucky, hopefully, um, and you'll have a blast when that happens. So, yeah. Oh man, you have to learn to embrace the chaos, as uh, as one of my drama teachers told me. Yeah, one of my friends is actually she's a working actress in England as well. Uh, she's actually not English, but uh, she works out there. And she was like, she went to an audition. I think she was like twenty nine at the time. She went to an audition for a character that was like early thirties, and they're like too old. And she was like, Oh, oh God. yeah, yeah, absolutely, that happens. Like, yeah, definitely. There's like, there's your real age, and then there's your like TV age. Um, yeah, I'm, I I go up for roles now that are like people in their thirties and forties because. And again, like you, you, you don't know, you don't know, because sometimes they'll rewrite the role. I had a, I have, um, I'm in talks about doing a theatre role soon, and the character is written as in her fifties, but they're like, "Well, we like you, so we might just change that," you know. So, so that sort of thing definitely happens as well. Um, it's Man. it's a very sort of chaotic industry. <laughs> I'm happy for you getting that job, but I'm also like, there's literally no jobs left for women past the age of like 40. <laughs> We're like, well, increasingly on TV, there is increasingly like well, on TV. Good. And and I have to say to Netflix's credit, they don't get everything right. But definitely there's a lot of roles out there for like older women in that kind of like that kind of hinterland of you're kind of post 25, but you're not quite kind of Helen Mirren, Judi Dench age. Um, that kind of like middle block, which is like most of our lives. Uh, there's there's more roles out there now for women like that. Um, if you can hang on in the game long enough. Uh. Nothing more despairing than seeing the age of who is it in Spider Man, and uh, his so, aunt. What, oh, no, uh, like Aunt May. Aunt May. Like she starts in the fr- in like the Tobey Maguire film. She's like eighty, and then she's like, and now it's like Marissa Tomei or whatever. I can't. Yeah. I can't deal with it. <laughs> Why can't we have old women anymore? Okay. So the time has come, you guys. You guys already know what time it is. It's our rapid fire question. So this is just how we end the show. Whatever comes to mind, feel free to skip a question. Just quick answers. What oh, is I'm the... really bad at this. Okay. <laughs> I'll, do what is... I'll do my best. I'll do my best. What is the big financial secret of your industry? And let's go with acting. Uh, no one has any money. <laughs> That's a good enough secret, except all the rich kids, I'm sure, who's like who come from like generational wealth and don't. Yes, have to that's care. true. Um, what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? I invest in makeup. I am cheap about socks. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What an unexpected answer. Okay. Um, I would love to meet the person who's like really into their socks. Actually, I think I do think we got that answer once of someone who likes really nice socks. Okay. What has been your single best investment and why? Can I say transition? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, then I would say that for reasons that I hope are kind of apparent. <laughs> what has been your biggest money mistake and why? <laughs> uh, I would say like the, the several years I spent before I came out on like really doubling down on masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> Like buying That's a gym true. membership and like like a like an expensive suit, uh, yeah, that was in hindsight an error. That's true. If memory serves, when we met up, I feel like you were in like an extremely dashing outfit, and I remember thinking at the time, like, I bet that wasn't cheap. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. The, you, I think we kind of met at the in as the last shreds of my denial <laughs> were evaporating away, and I was like, ah, oh, I better try really hard at this. Love it. Okay. What is your biggest current money insecurity? Oh, where I'm going to live in like a few years time. Because I mean, I, I can't afford to buy a house. No one in, in Britain can. 
Um, so, yeah, where I'm going to be living in like five years. Maybe on like an adorable farm in the English countryside making jam. <laughs> yeah, if you've got like five million just oh. spending a hole in your pocket. <laughs> Uh, what has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? I think just like being a bit of a cheap ass. <laughs> like, Hell yeah. Um, or rather not, not spending money that I don't have. So I don't, I, I try not to like, I try to very like definitively avoid going into any kind of debt about anything. If I can't afford something and I just like don't get it. Um, I, 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 a willingness to occasionally do without <laughs> That's good. We love living below your means. And the last question is, when did you first feel successful and what does that word mean to you? To me, if I can laugh about what I'm doing, then I'm succeeding. If I can, if I can laugh, whether that's a laugh of, ha ha, yes, I've done it. Or whether that's a laugh of, gosh, isn't this silly? Then, then I can, then that's when I'm succeeding. Um, even if I don't get the role, if I'm able to come out of, a, of an audition or a self-tape session and be like, that was hilarious. Like I had to do an audition recently where I had, where they, they, they made me do an accent that I just like have never studied and was terrible at. And I was, I was able to come out of the audition going, well, I didn't get that role, but it was incredibly funny that I had to do that. Like what a fantastic story. Um, so if I can laugh, then, uh, then I feel like I'm succeeding. Um, I love been, that answer. I'm happy to say I've been, I've been laughing for years. <laughs> I've been laughing at myself for a long time. Uh, so you kind of have to, if you're going to do acting. Love that answer. Well, thank you so much. And I apologize again to everyone who's reached this point in the conversation, listening to me sounding like the loser kid in like a 90s movie. Like I'm just like going to get beat up by the lockers because I'm like, hello. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, thank you so, so much for joining us, Abby. Where should people go to find more of what you do? Uh, Philosophy Tube is where you can usually find me on on YouTube and on socials. Um, other than that, uh, Buy, buy a TV. Um, <laughs> I I can't say some of the things that I'm gonna be in, but uh, yeah, just just keep 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 an eye on your screens, and uh, and I'll 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 be there, and uh, and maybe even stages soon. Who knows? Who Listen, knows? get like fifty TVs and tune every TV into a different channel, and eventually, statistically, eventually will I will pop up. Yeah, <laughs> I hope. Um, well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And as always, we will see you next Monday for an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Goodbye. Goodbye.